Hello everyone, welcome to another podcast of Lions Den Sport. Very pleased to be joined against by Zizu. Zizu, I got, you got to help me with your surname, man. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> How do you pronounce it again? Man? We practice about Al Mayuf. Yeah. Zizu Al Mayuf. Zizu, it's good to see you again, man. It's been a while, brother. Yeah, it's good to see you in person. It's good, it's last, good to time, see you. last time we did it. We did it in Zoom. Over a Zoom. I always said I'd never do it through, through Zoom. But for yeah. that time, I did do it for you. Yeah, and obviously Rachel as well. But it's so good to see you in person, man. It's good, it's good to see you in the UK. How are you finding your time here? Good, man. It's a good experience. It's yeah. good exposure to be around these camps, you know, high level fighters. And to just be around Buddy McGirt the whole time, that's honestly the main goal I have. So I need to soak in as much as I can from Buddy McGirt and the fighters that he trains because they're all high level. Yeah. I like to see how they move outside the ring more than how they move inside the ring and learn from that and pick up from that. It's, it's interesting you say outside the ring because if you see managers, like f if you if I refer to football, now when Jose, Jose Mourinho came to Chelsea, everyone used to go to matches in tracksuits and stuff. Yeah. When he come in, he totally changed the attitude. Everyone had to dress differently, eat differently, even walk differently. All this makes a difference in building that championship mindset. And what sort of people are you around Buddy, obviously you're around about Buddy McGirt. What sort of fighters are you training at the moment? So uh, for this UK camp, uh, he trained Dylan White and yes. uh, Dan Aziz. So Dylan White, right now we're in the Dan Aziz camp. British champion? Yeah, British champion. And uh, we just finished the Dylan White camp. He fought two Saturdays ago. Mm. Dylan White, man, was, was an amazing camp to be around, honestly. Now that it's done, I could talk all about it. It was just an unreal experience you know this is a fighter i grew up watching on tv yeah, a fighter same. i grew up me and my friends back in saudi arabia or back in egypt wherever i was me and my friends back home we used to stay up late night and watch his fights on tv and analyze everything and now it's come to a point where i was in his own camp and so i was just in awe the whole time mm. you know i was just watching how he deals with himself outside of the ring more than how he deals with himself inside the ring because we're all different inside the ring. Mm -hmm. We're all at different weight classes. We all have different instructions and teachings, but outside it's really cool to see how his mentality is, how Dylan White is so calm the whole time, so composed the whole time. He knows exactly how many rounds he's going to do how much time he's going to spend in training doing this or doing that. And he just m has a very well-rounded team around him who are more of his family, not mm -hmm. his team. But they all work so hard because they know that his success means all of their success. So for Dylan to give me that chance to join his camp was really amazing. You know, I'm... I never get used to this stuff, I told you, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been told so many times that it's impossible for a fighter from my side of the world to come this far. And so when I, when I have these little milestones of just joining these small camps, I never get used to it. It's always a childhood dream come true. Mm. It's quite interesting about Dillian White because when you see him on TV and you see him, he seems a very intimidating guy. Like he yeah. comes across very you know, aggressive and stuff. But loads of people that I've met him and you're similar, says that he's, he's a chill guy. He's, exactly. he's a down to guy, down to earth guy. Did you, did you, did he speak to you? Did he give you any advice about any training? All the time, all the time. Yeah. Dylan was treating me like his younger brother in that camp. Yeah. He would always explain to me stuff he's doing, why he's doing it. And he would always, you know, really get me in with the members of his team. So they all would just show me what they're doing to help him and, He'd always have me, like for example, fight week, he'd always have me around in his room. I'm always just watching how, how he is mentally in his room. But you said something very good about, if you know, if you see Dylan on TV, he's very intimidating and serious and stuff, which he is because he has that true character. And the best and true character of a person is to know that when it's time to joke and have fun, you have that side in you that can joke and have fun. But when it's time for business and it's time to get serious and put the work in, mm. then it's time to get serious and put the work in. And you could do both. You know, not because you're a fighter and you're a boxer or you're doing something serious in your life. You have to be walking around all still and with a frown on your face or angry the whole time. Mm. There's a time and place for that. There's a time and place for everything. And when it was time to put the work in, he put the work in. And when it's time to joke and have fun and really get that mentality up there, 
he could do that. So, like I said, there's a time and place for everything. Mm. Have that character of, you know, when it's time to have fun and joke, you're there. When it's time to put that work in and have that character, you're there as well, you know? So I just picked up from him to do both. Amazing, man. And what, who has he got in his camp? Who, who, what sort of people did you meet in his camp? So I met a lot of people, man. Uh, I met his younger brother. I met Magic as well. Magic is, uh, he's a manager, yep. but he also, he's a, he's in a really, a, he's just a very amazing person to be around. And he was around the whole camp. He's always been around Dylan's camps. And then uh, there was also Simon. And Simon is his uh, physical performance manager. And uh, so he just ties everything together, finds the gyms that Dylan is going to train at, uh, does takes care of his strength and conditioning mm. all that stuff so he's like the that performance uh, manager for his camp mm. and simon was a really cool person honestly uh, any injury you have any tightness you have he always figures it out he knows so much about the sport and about just the physical aspect of it so he had some people in his camp where I was like, you know what, maybe I should have that in my camp too. Mm. So is that what it is? Is that how it is at the high level? At the high level, you have a guy for everything. Yeah. You don't leave anything unturned. Yeah. So you have your massage therapist, you have your physical performance coach, mm. you have your strength and conditioning, you have these people around you that makes camp feel like family too. And that's what I felt with the Dylan White camp. Mm. And I looked at that, I said, that's what I want. I want that type of camp where it's not only people and business that's around you, but it's also family. Mm. And that was just a, a great uh, thing to see. Because who wants better for you than your family, huh? Exactly, exactly. So it's all about you coming up by bringing your family up and your friends and stuff up with you. Which is, which is what we all do it for, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, it's funny you say about having a specialist for every sort of different, like physio, a sports psychologist. Mm. The first the first boxer that I can remember that did that was Klitschko. Yeah. Vladimir Klitschko. And then obviously when he invited other boxers to his camp, like Joshua, Fury, I think that's where they sort of picked it up. And that's come down from there, trickled down. I think he was the one who sort of pioneered, pioneered that. Yeah, I remember watching uh, Lomachenko yeah. When he first came up and he would also s always show the mental performance aspect in his camps. I've seen that on your Instagram. Yeah. You're playing games on. Yeah. Yeah. You, that's what that's I, where yeah. I got a mental performance coach. I got a mental performance coach because this stuff is actually serious. Mm. It's real. You know, you need to deal with your fear, your doubt, your pressure. But that is one thing. And then to deal with your response time to deal with your problem solving, to deal with your reflexes, to deal with your, you know, all that mental performance that's required in the ring where when you see an opening, you take it straight away. And if the opening's there, how you find another opening. And when you feel like you've run out of openings, what a mental performance coach does to you is to teach you that patience mentally. You know, while your performance is required from your mental, he teaches you that patience and he teaches you that, you know, problem solving and different perspectives, but it's all using mental performance games and strategies. Mm. And with a mental performance coach, the one I have, his name is uh, Haytham. Uh, and um, it's like more of a lecture. When we're not doing those mental performance games, he's lecturing about the mind. Mm. He's lecturing about how you could have different scenarios and when you're put in that scenario, what to do, this scenario, what to do. So he just lectures and teaches you more about the performance of your mind. So when you're put in specific situations, you're like, I already, I already know what to do there. Hmm. It's really interesting. So is it, you said mental, what, what, what did you call it? A mental? Mental performance coach. So is it a sports psychologist? Yeah, it's a sports psychologist, but that's only part of his degree. Hmm. The other part is a mental performance certificate, hmm. you know? So that's also another, aspect yeah, that's well. also another aspect of it where a sports psychologist is there to get you out of your fear, pressure, doubt, thus he maximizes your performance. Hmm. But my coach, uh, he's from Egypt, my mental performance coach, he's from Egypt. So he understands my background, my culture. So it's easier for him to get me out of that pressure, doubt and fear 
which I used to suffer from very much, yeah. he get, he got me out of it. He maximized my performance, but then he took my performance to a whole other level by now giving me the response time is my is now faster in my head. My problem solving is better. My patience is better. All that is better. So when I'm in the ring, no matter what happens to me, I'm calm. Mm. And if I find an opening, I take it straight away. Yeah. And if I feel like I don't have any openings, I'm patient to to wait and open and find my own openings or create them. Yeah, correct. And you know, that's something I learned from uh, being around Dylan White and Dan Aziz this camp is, it's very weird. I also saw Joshua Boatsi spar. Okay. So Great I saw fire. I saw Dylan spar. I saw Joshua Boatsi spar. I saw Dan Aziz spar. Are they all in the same camp? Uh, they're all around the same area. So we'd always go from gym to gym. So okay. I, I got to see them work. And I'm just, I look like a little kid once these people start working. I stand in the ring and I just put a hand on my, you know, a hand on my head and I just watch. And I'm just, observing what everything to do and i went to coach buddy after the after the dylan white fight and then i went to him again after i saw bawatsi spar i was like coach it's weird that these high level fighters that are very successful or they're on their way up in joshua bawatsi um no matter what happens to them in the ring they're calm no matter what type of punch they take they're calm N like nothing happened like it's not it's not the end of the world if they take a big punch and if one punch lands their eyes are wide open and they're so calm because they know that there's a second and a third one coming that they need to block mm. and after they block the second and third they need to catch and counter so the calmness i saw especially in Dylan White because he's a heavyweight Mm. And so the punches you take from heavyweights, mm. imagine taking these punches from heavyweights. And I just saw Dylan in that fight be so calm. And I know the instructions he's been working on the whole camp in, you know, his defense and staying inside and trusting his defense. And he has that Archie Moore defense. So yeah. he's recently ad he's recently adapted that into yeah, his training. Yeah, yeah. Because he's he, he's now wanting to trust his defense. He's now wanting to feel comfortable in the firing zone. And so that was just great to see, amazing to see mm -hmm. the shots he, he would every once in a while take, but his body language and his calmness in the ring would do, would make you feel like he didn't, he didn't take a shot. He didn't take a shot at all, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it comes down to experience. As yeah, well. it comes down to experience. But Dylan talked about it a lot during camp. Composure. He kept saying, yeah, composure and calmness and, it's and not how showing he's any, learned it with time and experience. Yeah, And not showing your opponent any weaknesses. And that's the body language. He was, he was in that fight. He'd take the shot and he'd do that Archie Moore defense, start walking head up and, and chest up. Mm. And I've been, I've been in the ring and you've been in the ring too. And you know how it feels that when you land a very big shot and your opponent starts walking like nothing's happened at all. It's intimidating. You're like... Something that, that, bad that, is coming. Something's that, bad. No, no, that's where you need a sports performance coach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something coming. bad is coming. You know, I uh, for the Saudi fight, yeah, I thought. Yeah. yeah, we we spoke a couple of months before your Saudi yeah um, fight, and you know nothing was confirmed. It was just you had a fight, and it fell through, um, unfortunately. And then you, you were waiting for a a fight date to come up. And w when I first heard about the Joshua Usyk card. I, I thought of you. I thought you're coming on there, and then straight away I saw a post of you on the undercar, and I was yeah, like, "Wow, yeah. this guy!" The, you know, the, you're on there now. You're making your what a place to make your debut it's, uh, in front of your in front of your people, right? Yeah, yeah. How did that make you feel? Honestly, it's unreal. But there is something that it, the biggest thing I learned from the failed opportunities that I've had before, leading up to a successful one, is that if you practice patience nothing ever happens against you. Everything happens for you. So if you practice patience, nothing happens to you. It all happens for you. You just have to give it the time for it to unfold. You have, it, you have to give it the time to see what it's doing for you. But if you react instantly, then it's easy to say it happened to you. you know. But in the long run, we always see that things did play in our favor at the end. And that's what happened to me with that fight. Having that fight was was unreal. Honestly, 
I mean, I dealt with uh, the Minister of Sports, Prince Abdelaziz bin Turkil Faisal, and uh, I always preach and I always say that he's opening up those doors and he's giving us that exposure that the athletes of Saudi Arabia needed. And I want to be the most successful individual athlete to come out of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Mm. And with with that kind of exposure and push, I feel it will happen. And then you have Prince Khaled as well. Um, he's the one that uh, runs uh, SCE and uh, they're the company that brings all the boxing fights. What's, what's SCE? What does it to, stand for? Sorry? Uh, Skill Challenge Entertainment. Okay. So Prince Khaled, um, he's in charge of uh, Prince Khaled and Prince Fahad. They're in charge of Skill Challenge Entertainment and they bring the big boxing fights to Saudi Arabia. Prince Khaled especially, he saw it in me long before he even spoke to me about it. He, I would communicate to, to him, like I would communicate on Instagram. I'd send him some messages. And as soon as that fight got announced, I remember Prince Khaled sent me a message. I, react, I reacted to his story. And he sent me a message so casually. He's like, you're part of it. Just keep working. Wow. I was like, oh my. My dreams came true in a sentence. You know, he was like, you're part of it. Just keep working. And I texted Prince Khaled back and I told him, I will make you proud. I've been working hard for this. And the beautiful thing about it is he told me exactly this. He was like, I know you will. I know you will. I, I have no doubt. And so to have someone like this, you know, just not put pressure on you, but show you that he trusts you, it's two different things. Mm -hmm. You know, to say that you need to win or you, uh, we have confidence in you that you will do this, that's one thing, but to say, I know you will win. I know you've been working. That's trust, you know, and he put that trust in me. So Prince Abdelaziz bin Turk Al Faisal and Prince Khaled, they have really opened up those doors for me. And then the vice president of the Saudi Boxing Federation, hmm. her name is uh, Rosh Al Khamis. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we spoke about her before yeah. on the last episode we did together. She, she saw it in me before everyone else did. Mm. And she took my name and she pushed it out there. And then she's, she revamped the whole federation. Yeah. So the, the, the pace that Saudi Arabia is moving at right now with Vision 2030 and the things that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is doing in Saudi Arabia is revolutionary. Mm. And it will change a lot of stuff. And as you can see right now, it's the fastest growing economy in the world. Mm. Things are happening not just fast, but too fast for anyone else to catch up on and I will hope to be part of that. There's a lot of things going over in that part of the world. Yeah. Obviously, Qatar, you've got the World yeah. Cup going on, yeah. which is amazing at the moment. It's yeah. It's been amazing. Like, How many shocks have we seen so far? What a World Cup, Absolutely yeah. crazy. And then in Saudi, you've got the, you obviously had the Joshua Usyk fight there mm -hmm. recently. You had the WWE yeah. events going yeah, on there. Yeah. So they're really investing in sport in that part of the country. Yeah. What What is it about sport that they want to push sport out sport. Why, why is it that, do you think they want to do that? So I feel like with Saudi Arabia, using sports and big um, events to attract tourism into the, to, to the country. So the thing about Saudi Arabia is they're using sports and events to attract tourism into the country. Mm -hmm. And they want to show people that they have maybe the wrong perception. If you have any perception at all, about Saudi Arabia because not me, not many people were uh, able to go to the country before and not many people are wanting to go to the country now. But as we see those events and sporting events, people are attracted to go to the country more as they see the truth in Saudi Arabia, you know. But attracting tourism through sports and events is such a great thing and a smart way to do it because it promises you that type of comfort when you go to a country that you don't know much about. Mm. So when you go to a big boxing event in a country you don't know much about, like Saudi Arabia, you're like, okay, so no matter what happens to me in Saudi Arabia or how many unknowns I have surrounded by me, I know that I've been to a boxing fight before and that I know and that I'm comfortable being at. So you know your way around 
a boxing fight mm. you know and then for example also formula one they host formula one so when they yeah. have formula one they attract so many people from abroad who maybe they don't know much about the country and still have yet to see what's actually in it and what the people are actually about but when they go they know that they've been to a formula one before or they've watched one before so it gives you that sense of comfort already that you have something that you're comfortable with going to that unknown area. Yeah. There's also, you mentioned it, so it's right for me to bring it up. It's a lot of people have doubt about going into the country. Yeah. There's a lot of things um, about workers' rights and stuff over there uh, that you hear in the news Yeah. about um, people of the community are not, I'm not, I'm not saying not welcome, but you have to respect their little, like no, no drinking and stuff like that. Do you reckon things like that would change as it goes forward? Even the um, LGBTQ community and stuff like that. Do you reckon stuff like that would be more accepted in time? So what I know most about and the field that I'm involved in most is sports. And that I can speak about and confidently say that as long as we keep hosting these big events and getting that exposure not only to the people in Saudi Arabia mm. but also having that exposure to the people abroad seeing Saudi Arabia and how it is then things will undoubtedly change in sports that's what I can talk about because that's what I'm involved in 100%. all the other advancements and stuff that all goes back to the country the culture and the roots mm. you know some stuff in culture and roots like when Saudis or Arabs or that side of the world, whenever they travel abroad, we respect the culture and roots and laws given outside. Mm. And that's what you have to not even ask for. You shouldn't even ask for the same respect back. It's yeah. a given. Yeah. It's a given that we all come from different roots and cultures and rules and laws and all that. So the beautiful thing to it should be accepting everyone how they are and accepting every country how its culture is and how they deal with their own you know people and day-to-day -day lives mm. but the beauty in it is not to try to change everyone and make them like you because how do you know that your way is the right way and how do you know that your way your way might be the right way for yourself and the people you know but the, what you think is right for you and the people you know Maybe it's not right for other people. Yeah. So everything right will always come at the right time. Don't try to force it on other people. Uh, how, how old are you? 22. 22. You're a yeah. baby and that's such a, such a beautiful answer is respecting people's cultures, yeah. respecting people's um, way of their upbringing and not trying to change everyone is exactly. what you're trying to say. Exactly. And slowly, slowly, people will start adapting and accepting yeah. what is a problem. Yeah, but slowly and slowly people will start adapting not to the so-called modern mm. conception of how we should live our lives but slowly people are going to start adapting to other people have different ways of living their lives yeah you know and that we we just have to respect you know mm. it all starts with respecting it after you learn to respect it maybe we can open the conversation about a different perspective to it yeah. that maybe other people will listen to and maybe other people won't. Well, well what but, we have seen is with the World Cup yeah. is that there was a lot of lot of negative, how can I put it, negative wording or whatever going yeah. into it. But the responses that we've had since, that's sort of died down. Exactly. And it, exactly. You know, they're just talking about the quality of football and how, how, how much of a beautiful place it is as well. And that shows you that it's slowly, slowly perceptions are changing. Yeah, so um, I think the biggest thing with that is people usually fear what they don't understand. Hmm. And in that side of the world, this is something that they didn't understand or know much of. Now, because people fear what they don't understand, usually when you're put in an unfamiliar environment, because people usually <laughs> are... Oh, I gotta rephrase this. No, it's, no, I assume it's like people coming to India, for yeah, example. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a different culture. They, they do things that you think, oh, what they're doing that for? Yeah. Oh, what's this? If same place you go to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It's that, that sort so, of principle. Yeah, because, because people fear what they don't understand. When you're put in, in an unfamiliar environment, your initial reaction to it mm. is usually shock. 
And when you're shocked, you're always trying to look for validation for that shock, for that fear or for that misunderstanding that you have. Mm. And the easiest things to see when you're first looking around are the negatives. And that's what people did when it came to the World Cup in Qatar. They started, they didn't understand Qatar how a country like Qatar would have and host the World Cup. So they started looking around for something to validate that feeling. Mm. And they, when they started looking around, they found the negatives because the negatives are always easier to find for the, than the positives. Mm. Because the negatives are always there. They're just lying around there. All you have to do is look around and you'll find them. But the positives, you actually have to look for them. So looking around for the positives and searching for them is not enough. You really have to look and wait to see the positives come. Because yeah. the negatives are easier to see because the negatives are always coming earlier than the positives do. Yeah. But as we wait and as we've heard more news from the people who are in Qatar watching the World Cup in the stadiums, we got positive feedback. Mm. Nothing bad from the people there, right? Nothing bad from the people in the Arab world right now watching the World Cup. Yeah. So it's easy to talk when you're not there. But once you go and you visit... It's different. And that's the same expectation that Saudi Arabia has. Exactly, man. Well, I, think I want to move on from that. That's a, that's a great subject yeah, to talk yeah. about. So, uh, thank you for being so open on that as well. Is I want to go back to Buddy McGurk. Yeah. Because, you know, what a person to have it in, in your yeah, corner. What honestly. what experience to have. Obviously, he was in Ontario Gatti's uh, corner when he was had, had, the, had the fights with... Um, with the Irish fighter, I can't remember his name mm-hmm. now. Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward, that's it. And what fights there were... Um, and obviously he's gone on to coach many fighters since then. Trezora, Dillian White, yeah. yourself, uh, Dan Aziz. Um, what has he added to your game? So the beautiful thing about training with Buddy McGirt and any fighter who's worked with him will say the same thing is that Coach Buddy doesn't take you in and change what you have. He adds to what you already have. He adds to the strengths you have and he takes your weaknesses and changes them to work depending on the stuff he's going to add to you. So I remember when I first started with Coach Buddy, I told him, Coach, I know I move a lot. You know, I'm always moving in the ring and I use my footwork a lot. So are we going to have to take that away? I I asked him that question and he said, no, we're just going to add to the arsenal. Mm. We're just going to make sure you have more in the arsenal that when you need to stand your ground and fight and trust your defense, you have the arsenal to do that. And when you need to move and use your footwork that you beautifully have, you're going to have more in your arsenal to use that. But you need to know when it's time to move, when it's time to stand your ground and uh, be in that firing zone and trust your defense. And that's the good thing about Coach Buddy. But in terms of what he's added to my game, I'll just tell you this. It's been three months now Hmm. since I've came back into camp, since the Saudi fight. And in these three months, I haven't used my right hand once on the back. It's all been the left hand. Just the jab. Just the jab. Just my left hand. Jab, hooks, body shots, everything with the left hand. Anything we do in the shadow boxing, you know, if we do 10 or 12 rounds of shadow boxing, that I could use my right hand, you know, but anything we do on the bag is just my left hand. What has he identified that, has he identified an area of improvement on your jab? No, is he's that- identified an area of strength. So he knows, I think he sees that I have a good jab. So I don't know why we're doing all this. And I don't ask because I trust him. You know, you can't, you, what else do you have than to trust a two time world champion and a Hall of Famer? Mm. So, for a fighter like me coming from where I came from, to have a coach like Buddy McGirt is a dream come true. You know, so, and he gave me that dream and opportunity. And so, when we do anything, I'm not asking why. He's my coach at the end of the day. Yeah. My job is to do it. You mm. know, now if I have questions, I'm going to ask, but I don't have a question. I know that working on my left hand, over time is never going to be bad. So he's seen a strength in my left hand and in my jab and in my left hooks that other people and many people have been talking about. But he's noticed them and he now feels like this is the time where 
it's it's the time to work on them hmm. and you know i'm not i'm not minding that i love working on my jab i love working on my left hooks and my body shots what's the most important shot in boxing and the jab is the, the first jab. thing they teach you yeah so just to be around coach buddy is something great but not only in the ring but also outside of the ring he kind of shows you how to deal with yourself outside of the ring how to be smart in negotiations what to say what not to say what to ask of people you know before any move you make you got to ask yourself what's what's in it for me how what am i going to benefit from that what am i going to benefit from this fight or fighting that person this or that you know boxing is a very complicated business mm. and to have someone who understands the game who's been there and done that just gives you that mental confidence that you need going into it i think the sport when you're in the ring is simple yeah it's outside of the distractions that you got outside you got the business side of things you got the attention that you get outside yeah. of things as well which you're probably getting now yeah, yeah. um how, how are you dealing with that sort of stuff outside of the ring honestly this is the stuff i've been dreaming for since i was a kid mm. and because i visualized with my mental performance coach i visualized my life after a win <laughs> like that and i visualized the interviews and the podcasts i've kind of manifested them yes. i've worked on that law of attraction and i'm just living what i've manifested right now i'm living what i've prayed for from god now and to me i've always said that what's imp more important than winning the fights for me and doing so much in boxing is what I do outside of boxing and the message I deliver outside of boxing. And that's what I'm doing right now. When I do podcasts, when I do interviews, I try to just preach how your character and you as a person will reflect in the ring and in your job. So I just want to send that message of we're stronger together. You know, the Arab world is so strong once we unite. And like you're seeing, for example, today Morocco beat Portugal in the World Cup and the whole Arab Crazy. world Crazy. is united to support Morocco. Mm. Now Morocco feels invincible. Mm. And they just went to the semi-final as the first African and Arab country to ever make it this far in the World Cup. And that's how I feel when I'm fighting, when I'm boxing. I feel like I represent Saudi Arabia and I represent Egypt, but I'm also representing the whole Arab world mm. because they're all united with me. Yeah, man. So to be a representative of Saudi Arabia is historical, but to also know that the whole Arab world is supporting me is a whole other feeling. Um, which they are. I yeah. mean, which they certainly are. I've, I mean, I can, when I was boxing, I had that same mentality. I was like, obviously I'm British. I'm yeah. from here, born. Yeah. But my deep roots are, I'm Sikh, I'm Punjabi, right? Yeah, yeah. So, it's about representing my culture. We come from a warrior background. Yeah. And it's about representing that exactly. and doing that with pride. You know what exactly. I mean? And that's similar. That comes across like similar yeah. to you as well. That's something you want to do. Yeah. You know what's crazy to me is um, going into my fight. Yeah. There was a lot of talk back home or from people that knew me that kept doubting my performance in the fight. What is but this they, after the fight? Yeah. 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 After oh, the God. fight, I didn't know about any of this before the fight, but I've had phone calls after the fight of people telling me you don't understand man people were doubting your performance in the ring they said do you think he's actually going to perform because back in the amateurs i used to be very scared before i perform which is natural you know you get that fear of performing and sometimes that affects your actual performance and i used yep. to have that so so now my point is people were doubting my performance in the ring, but more so they were doubting my mental performance in the ring. Now, thinking about it, looking back, if I had known that, would you think that I'd work so hard and be around so many great fighters and spar champions and go through what I went through to even make it to the steps of that, of that ring in that fight, only to be scared or to worry when it's time to fight. Mm. Everything I've faced before that fight, before the actual fight in the ring, is more scary than what the fight was. Yeah, Everything yeah. I've faced before it is harder mm. than what the fight would be. Mm. So to doubt someone's performance 
when they've reached a peak physical performing level is crazy. It's unnatural. It, it doesn't make sense because you need to know if you're watching someone who's about to perform on a very big stage, know 100% that what it took to reach that big stage was much harder than the performance he's about to put in right now. Hmm. Was much more difficult than the performance he's about to put in right now. Was much more mentally draining than how mentally draining it would be when he's performing in that job sport ring right now. Hmm. So you just need to know that when when us fighters, when the boxers or fighters or any athlete is performing at a very high level, know that this is where they're comfortable. They're there for a reason. What it took and the work it took to get to that level, now that's the uncomfortable part. Yeah. So that's what I just found crazy. <laughs> but what it is as well, is you're gonna get this now. When you're in the press, when you're, when you're out there on these big shows, yeah. People are gonna doubt you. Yeah. People are gonna say, "Oh, they're gonna look into your past." Yeah. Right. He was. He showed exactly. weakness here. We're gonna. You know. He's, he's gonna show that weakness again. But what you've done, and all the best box, all the yeah. people who are self-aware, know that. Right. This is an area that needs to be developed. You knew that mentally. Yeah. This exactly. is an area, and I, I've I've been in that situation myself, yeah, yeah. where you've known that mentally you need support. No, mm -hmm. Not support. You just need some something to help you grow yeah, exactly and you've got you've identified that and you've brought yeah, that on board yeah and that was the first thing i brought on board but my, I'll, I'll, I'll that, be the exactly the same yeah bringing that mental aspect to my game was the most important part and it is the most important important part in my team right now yeah i always say that the most important coach in my team right now is my mental performance coach yeah. because he controls way more than what i can control hmm. you know the easiest part is the fighting. The easiest part in all of this is the physical. Hmm. I can push my body to and run the miles, yeah. to put in the sparring, to show up to training every day. I can push my body to do that. But can I push my mental to maximize my performance while running, to maximize my performance while sparring, to maximize my performance while fighting on fight night? Can I do that? That's what I needed work on. And now it's bulletproof, thank God. I know, man. I, I want to tell you a story that I had a regarding a mental coach so I, I I had a fight in 2016 here at national level and I lost to a boy that I should have beat yeah and I was so down I was so down and my coach at the time he's like you know what do you want to do he says I know this guy I reckon you should speak to him so I was so down and I, I spoke to him he's a, he's a mental performance coach yeah and he talked about the chimp ch chimp uh, the, has your coach said about that about the little chimp in your brain no. No. So there's a little chimp in your brain, and how you that that says negative thoughts into your head, yeah. and he teaches you how to manage that. Yeah. I did two sessions with the guy, and I had to I had a fight in I had to fight in America mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks later, and I faced a two-time national champion. I put my best performance. Yeah. Just from two. Co exactly. It shows you that just changing exactly, that yeah. mindset negative to positive. Yeah. You can show your ability. Yeah. Tenfold. Exactly, exactly. And the the great thing with with mental with a mental performance coach and the great thing with my mental performance coach is he doesn't teach you that there will be negative thoughts in your head. He teaches you to expect them. Mm -hmm. And he teaches you that it's natural. And once you expect something and you feel like something is natural, you know how to deal with it better. So that's what he teaches me. So you will, like you, like you said, you will have the people talk. You will have the negatives more than the positives actually because the negatives are easier to talk to than the positives ever will be. Yeah. So the more you expect that, the easier it will be to deal with it. And that's what I do, you know. I just know that in me, I'm representing so much more on boxing when I'm fighting. So much more than boxing when I'm training because I'm living the dreams of so many. And I'm representing a country that's so big. And I'm representing a side of the world that's huge. You know, if there's one thing we know about the Arab world and Saudi Arabia, it's that once you start doing something for the country and the people in it, they're with you no matter what. Mm. They have your back no matter what. You know, before my fight and on a stage that big, everybody's watching. So if you lose, yeah. not only do you look bad, but so many other people look bad. But I want to tell you that the amount of messages and DMs that I got from people 
that they weren't even telling me, no, good luck, we wish you win, we know you will win. They weren't saying that. They were saying that we just want you to know that we know the work you've put in and we have your back no matter what, win or lose. When I get these messages, you know, you harder. Yeah, yeah, it just makes you, it makes you want to win more. Yeah. It makes you want to win even more because when you're on a stage that big, no matter what happens to you in that fight, if you go down, you're getting back up. No matter how many times I'm telling you, because you're fighting for so much more than yourself. Mm. So I can go down and sparring and not get up, but put me on in that fight night where I'm, the work is done now and it's time to put in that work and I'm fighting for so much more than myself, no way am I gonna let that, you know, yeah. go go loose. I think the, the most successful boxers that I can think of, they don't just fight for themselves, they fight for a course. Yeah. I can tell you right away, Canelo. Mm -hmm. Who does he fight for? Mm -hmm. What's the first thing he says? He, obviously, thanks God. Yeah. Viva Mexico. Yeah, Mexico. You say, um, who, who else is there from that side? You got, uh, have you got someone called Dylan Chima? No. He's a, he's a boxer, he's Punjabi, he's, he's got his Asian, first thing he always says, yeah, thank Manny God. Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao, Filipinos. You mean so, Manny Pacquiao is, is, uh, is, is something else now. Yeah, when but he's he a senator, right? He's a yeah. senator. So it's like... You're going down that route now, ain't you? <laughs> I hope I could be like Manny Pacquiao, man. I hope like I could be the likes of Muhammad Ali, Manny Pacquiao, Mo Salah, like how he is in the Arab world, you know? I, this, is, this, is, this is my goal. Hmm. These are who I idolize and wish to be like and who I'm working towards wanting to be like. So it's all that work that one day it'll pay off. And I know that one day it will pay off because I have the faith in God to do so. And, you know, I don't want to be one of those fighters that says I will accept a loss. And I know that, you know, it's impossible not to lose and stuff. But the beautiful thing about the journey I'm on right now is that there are so many eyes w on it. There are so many people watching and so many people that are inspired by it. So as much as I don't want to lose, as much as I hope one day that I know maybe I will get a loss, but what's better than, you know, getting a loss is that I know that with the amount of people watching, and the amount of people I'm inspiring by this journey is that I could teach them so much on how to come back from a loss mm. and how to crawl your way back up and how that, you know, it's just about dusting the rust off and, you know, dusting your shoulders and keep going and do what you do. Mm. So, you know, I'm accepting to anything that's going to come into that journey. But one thing for sure is that we're gonna keep fighting and keep doing this. Not not for me, but for everyone else. What else? I, I, something that's just come in my head. I want to ask you about the Saudi Arabia. So I was watching the press press conference. Yeah. And you were on the press yeah. conference. You also had the other undercard fighters. One other undercard fighter that was on there was someone called Ben Whitaker. Yeah. He was um, he was very boisterous. Yeah. He was yeah. All, you know I'm the best here. Yeah. I'm, I'm the. How was he outside of the ring and and stuff like that with you guys? You know he was he was actually very very chill very cool yeah me and him would were joking before and after the press conference started you know many people were talking about what he said during the press conference and how he said it but listen everyone has their own personality mm. and this is one of the biggest stages that in in the boxing world if not in the sports world during that time and how you choose to express yourself during these moments is all up to you at the end of the day it's Ben that's going to go in there and fight. Mm. Every Everything so, so many people are saying about him isn't gonna go in there with him. He has the right mentality. He's not gonna take the words from the people and what they're saying about him inside. But Ben Whitaker outside of it was very chill. Yeah. Very, a very confident guy. Yeah, very yeah confident. so he should be. Yeah. What ability. Exactly, yeah. very confident in his abilities as he should be. Now how he chooses to express that confidence that's all up to him. Mm. What is going to maximize his performance? What is going to get the eyes watching? What is going to get the people listening and the people watching his fights? Because I'll tell you something for sure, in sports especially, love you or hate you, they're going to tune in. So he's just taking the approach that he wants to take and love him, you're going to watch. Hate him, you're still going to watch. Mm. Now, everyone is going to be different, you know, 
I don't get involved in other people's stuff and how they talk or yeah, how they yeah, do. But the one Best thing I know, be, yeah. yeah, the one thing I know is how I'm going to conduct myself, how I'm going to express myself, but to each their own. This is what I do. Ben Whitaker expresses himself in a good way. And he, it, if it works for him, it's a good way. Mm. So so do that. He went to the Olympics, right? He won silver medal there as well. Yeah. So he, I, I, he's, yeah, he's quite yeah. an accomplished boxer. Yeah. What, what, what did you, how was the night over there? Like your fight was done. You had the other fights come on. You had Anti Joshua versus yeah. Usyk. How was that fight? How was the at uh, atmosphere and stuff <laughs> for that? So listen, the beautiful thing about being on the undercard of Usyk Joshua was that I was there as a fan hmm. and as a fighter. Actually, sometimes I would forget that I'm there as a fighter. <laughs> you know, I had I had two of my childhood best friends with me yeah. that have grown up with me and I took them with me to spend fight week with me because if you know fight week is very difficult, mm. especially with the pressure that I'm going into. I mean, it's huge pressure. Yeah, man. It's the my first professional fight, my first time eating punches in eight ounce gloves. In how, how did that feel? Horrible. <laughs> felt like I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to take any clean you don't punches that in pretty eight face up, no. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> I've been working on my defense too much now. But uh, eight ounce gloves don't joke, man. Yeah, but eight ounce gloves don't joke. You know the shots you take in sparring that wake you up. If you take these shots in a fight in eight ounce, you're going to sleep. But you wear sixteens in sparring. Do you wear sixteens in sparring? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like you know this. This is stuff sixteen and fourteen. And 14. Right? Yeah, so it's like these punches, those eight ounce gloves They're not nice, are, huh? are horrible. Yeah, so, but yeah, I was there as a fan and as a fighter. And so when we'd be done with my public workout, me and my friends would hang out. All the other fighters would go to the hotel and rest, but me and my friends would hang out. It's like, Auntie Joshua's coming out right now. <laughs> Usyk is coming out right <laughs> now. I'll be something like me yeah. as well. I'll be like that. The press conference, after the undercard press conference was done, all the fighters left. Me and my friends were hanging out in the back <laughs> watching, standing. We weren't even sitting down. We were standing watching Usyk I and love Joshua that. talk. I love yeah, that. So it was, it, it's a dream, you know. I'm telling you, I was there as both. And then after the fight, um, of course, Saudi Arabia had me and my family sitting ringside, Amazing. and they gave us tickets ringside, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I didn't want that. I told them I want to be up, you know, I want to be higher up, because I wanted. To, I always imagined when I go to a very big boxing fight like Usyk and Joshua as a mm -hmm. kid, I always imagined that I'd be sitting high up, you know, mm -hmm. and I could see the amount of people around me. So I had my family and I had myself sitting up, up there after the fight, after I just won and made history on that card for Saudi Arabia, I was sitting there, just up there, just watching the rest of the well, fights. Were people taking brother, photos with you up there? All or? the time, all the yeah. time. I felt I felt like I was on top of the world. Yeah. Man. But the beautiful thing about boxing, and many people maybe would disagree um, or suffer from, not disagree, many athletes or many successful people who get that short-term success, because boxing at the end of the day is all about short-term success the hype that you get right before your fight, right after your fight, and then the hype dies hmm. until you announce your next fight. Do, do you know what? I just want to touch base on that yeah. because I've done a few podcasts with boxers. Yeah. And some people say they have that hype. They're selling tickets, the build up, yeah. training, yeah. fighting. They win their fight. And then f after that, the next day, everything's down. And they... They turn to other things. Like, yeah. well, um, you know, if you check the podcast, they said that, you know, they've done smoking and, yeah, and whatever because yeah, yeah, yeah. they need that same adrenaline yeah. adrenaline rush yeah. how, how do you cope with that as well like that down feeling I, I know you've only done it done it once but you don't yeah. end it in the amateurs as yeah, well right yeah, yeah. Um, how well, do you cope with that look um, I cope with that by understanding that it's an advantage for me so what is the biggest piece of advice that I got after finishing that fight and being on a very big stage in boxing was don't get in all over your head. Don't, you know, don't start like not working as hard or don't fall in for the hype. And having that that hype taken away after the fight keeps you grounded. Mm. It keeps you working harder. It keeps you chasing that same feeling again. But in 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 terms of chasing that feeling again, I mean working that hard to have a win with the same quality so you have that same feeling and adrenaline and hype the next time you fight. Mm. But 
if you go and try to get that same feeling from if it's smoking or a night out or drinking, it's not the same feeling. It's not the same adrenaline. It's not the same hype. Yeah. You know, the beautiful thing about it for me is making the people proud, expressing the people and representing Saudi Arabia, representing the Arab world, showing them how we are as characters and people that so many people have misperceptions on, you know, the Arab world and how we are there. So I love making people proud. This is what I'm in the sport for, making my parents proud, making my family proud, making my country proud, making history. So what guarantees me that is my next performance. Okay, well, then what guarantees my next performance being a win is the work I put in. So if the work I put in is harder than the work I put in before leading up to my last performance, then if I work harder now, my next performance is going to be better and I'm going to get that same hype and adrenaline. Mm. So when you reach high success and you get that short-term high adrenaline and high levels of hype, mm. and after your success, that hype dies down, you shouldn't worry or be scared because there are two roads to walk now. Either you take that feeling being taken away as motivation to work harder to get that same feeling again or better on the same stage that got you that feeling to begin with or you have the other word to work the other road to walk where it's now you're going to stop working mm. because you feel so bad and sad about yourself that you don't say don't have that same hype what do you expect from people you need to expect that if you're out of sight you're out of mind mm. so what you should be working on next is to be back in sight but when you're back in sight again it's better than the last time you were in sight. So you stick in their minds for longer. Yeah. But why are we talking about football players for so much? They play two or three times a week. Yeah. They're always in sight. Yeah, they always train. Basketball players, always in sight. Yeah. But do we talk about Michael Phelps year round? Do we talk about Usain Bolt year yeah. round? Do we talk about the Olympic athletes year round? No, we don't. You know, there are some players that we're watching in the World Cup right now that we're talking about so much. Are we talking about them year-round? Do, does Morocco, if Morocco win the World Cup, are we going to be talking about it in six months? Oh, that'll be talking for years, that's yeah, centuries. But, but we're not going to keep talking about it day to day. The hype isn't going to be there every day. It's not going to be the same levels of yeah, hype yeah, every day. So as an athlete, you need to understand, or as a performer in anything, or wanting to chase anything, you need to understand that short-term success comes with short-term hype and adrenaline but a lot of short-term success will eventually lead to your long-term success and long-term hype and adrenaline like we're talking about muhammad ali's name right yeah. now after he's yeah. gone yeah mike tyson's name after he's retired yeah you know george foreman van der holyfield prince nasim all of these people all these great great fighters all of these great great fighters are now retired we're still talking about them and they're out of out of sight, but we're, they're still in our minds. I know, man. It's crazy, isn't it? It's so shows you that there's opportunity there. You mentioned something just really quickly. I just want to touch base that we haven't touched on is family. Yeah. You, you you said it you said it slightly, and you said you want to do it to make your mum and dad proud. Yeah. What does it, what does your family mean to you? I mean, this is who I'm doing it for. If I was if I wasn't doing this for my family, I wouldn't still be doing it. Honestly. Boxing is a tough sport. Yeah. It's a cruel sport. Yeah. I've seen so much in it and I've lost so much because of it and I've sacrificed and I've sacrificed so much for it. But when I'm doing it for the family, it's all worth it. When I'm doing it for my country in Saudi Arabia, it's all worth it. When I'm doing it for the Arab world, it's worth it. That feeling who could be presented the chance to write history for the Arab world or for Saudi Arabia and boxing and say, nah, I don't want to do that. Or no, I, I, you know what? I don't want to go through all this for it. So I was just given a chance, an opportunity that what makes me stick to it so bad is I keep asking myself the question of, well, if this same opportunity was given to someone else in Saudi Arabia or given to someone else in Egypt, what would they do with it? The hours and the days that I feel like I don't want to go to the gym, I ask myself, well, if that other person that I'm imagining right now was given that same opportunity, he'd be in the gym eight days, eight days a week, you know? He'd find a way to add a day to the week and be there. Mm. So that's why I'm so committed into 
have a fight or not have a fight. I'm always there because I'm doing it for my family. You know, my mom has been there through the whole journey. My dad has been there through the whole journey. My family supports me through throughout it all. So I can only give them back the only way I know how to, and that's through boxing and success. Amazing, man. Yeah. What a way to sort of finish it off. Yeah, there. yeah. Zizu, I, I really appreciate your time. That was a great talk. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, do you know what? I feel like I can talk to you for another uh, another yeah, couple of hours, yeah. but obviously there's so much more I want to ask you as well. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, you got to go. We're sh short a bit of time. But next time when you're in the UK, Definitely. Uh, next time we're in the LA, I'm, I'm due down there pretty soon. We've got some things coming up. Uh, we'll link up and we'll do, so, do something Definitely, more. Definitely, bro. Definitely. Thank you very much, bro. All the best. Guys, thank you very much for listening.